How many times have you done this? And I, I told him I don't remember. Uh, that's how long I've been around. Um, I, I just told everybody up here to sit down. They actually did it. So things are starting off pretty good for me this year. Um, I'd like to welcome everybody. I see a lot of familiar faces out here. I'd like to start off by thanking all these people up here. We really believe um, public service is something that you choose to do, not something that you have to do. So we really appreciate your service. I know it's, um, this is the holiday, so I think I can promise to get you out of here at about the right time. And in part, I can say that because David Catania is no longer up here and he's not going to be addressing the crowd. <laughs> Too much? Too soon for that? <laughs> like I said, I've been doing this a long time. Right now, we'd like um, everybody to stand for the presentation of colors by the Metropolitan Police Department Honor Guard. And then we're going to have Valerie Dawkins with the national anthem. Oh, say, can you see by the dawn's early light what so proudly we held at the twilight's last gleaming whose broad stripes and bright stars through the perilous fight or the ramparts we watched were so gallantly streaming and the rockets regular the bombs bursting in air gave proof through the night that our flag 
was still there. Oh, say, does that star-spangled banner yet wave o'er the land of the free? Okay, if you uh, could continue standing, we'd like to get to Reverend Dr. Joseph W. Daniels, Jr., pastor of the Emory Fellowship Church. May we pray. Our Lord and our God, we are so grateful that you have awakened us to this new year, the blessing of this time. We're so grateful for this city and for the leadership that you are calling forth to guide us and direct us and lead us for such a time as this. Lord, if we've ever needed you, we need you now. And if we've ever needed your leadership in this city, united, collective, powerful, we need it now. So we ask that you would be present with us as we thank you for the servants who have come before you now to be sworn in and to lead this city, this great city, this magnificent city, the best city in the world, that you would lead us forward mightily and powerfully. We ask you to be present with us now in the name of the one who some in the room call Yahweh, in the name of the one who some in the room call Allah, in the name of the one who I call Jesus. Amen. Please be seated. Okay, we'd like to hear from uh, the district's congressional delegate, the Honorable Eleanor Holmes Norton. Good morning and happy new year, fellow Washingtonians and guests. I thank Mayor Bowser, Council, Chairman Mendelssohn and our council for grabbing the reins of our city the first working day of the new year to organize and get to work. I do not get sworn in as a member of Congress until tomorrow. <laughs> DC is always up front. <laughs> but I have to tell you, DC, you don't have to be doing much to be ahead of the Congress. As the new Congress begins, I ask only that the city continue to go about its day-to-day -day business as if the Congress did not exist. That may seem like ignoring the monster in the room. The disappointments of the 2016 elections left one commentator to sum up 2016, and I'm quoting him, as a miserable maggot rot of a year. That year has passed now, my friends. And I ask you to approach 2017 as I do with optimism. For starters, Congress is beginning in a state of confusion. The President-elect and the Republican-controlled House and Senate start on different pages on major issues confronting our country. Trade, Putin and Russia, infrastructure, for example. I intend to take advantage of congressional confusion to benefit the district wherever I can. However, I am disappointed by calls by some observers for Congress to fix crime issues 
in the District of Columbia because of the mixture of local and federal control of our criminal justice system. The statute that has stirred the most concern and controversy, the Youth Rehabilitation Act, was passed by DC authorities without any federal intervention. I commend Councilmember Charles Act Allen, although just appointed to chair this council's Judiciary Committee for charting early home rule action. Any changes in our criminal justice system should be initiated and recommended by the District of Columbia, not the Congress of the United States. Of course, Congress ultimately may have to pass legislation to make improvements, but it should follow the district's lead, not the other way around. Nothing is more dangerous for the District of Columbia than suggestions for congressional intervention, especially today. The House is a hotbed of members who look for opportunities to violate home rule and paste their own agendas on the district and there are no positive indications on where the president-elect stands on DC's right to self-government. Faced with a Republican executive branch, the Republican Congress no longer has Obama and his Democratic administration to attack. DC is an inviting target. Watch what you wish for. The only gifts that Congress has for the district are burdens we do not want or need. Recognizing that expectations of doom can be self-fulfilling, let us choose a different course. When Newt Gingrich became Speaker of the House after 40 years of Democratic control, the end of the world was forecast. With Newt as Speaker, however, DC had some of its best years in the Congress. Newt as Speaker did not violate home rule he helped us protect home rule, and he protected DC from shutdowns. Newt assisted our efforts that removed DC from insolvency, allowing the district to build a new economy, now considered one of the best in the nation. Of course, each Congress brings new actors and new issues, none more so than the upcoming 115th Congress. The district, as a democratic stronghold, is particularly vulnerable to an, a conservative or Republican federal government. Yet the last Congress gave the district something of a dry run that we will try to repeat. We had an all Republican, Republican House and Senate. But working in the Senate, we saved the budget autonomy referendum from being all overturned, defeated eight attempts to block or overturn DC's gun safety laws, defeated 18 other attempts to overturn other DC laws, and got a record $40 million for DC TAG, the federal program that has doubled college attendance for our young people. <clears throat> we do not underestimate what a Republican executive and a Republican Congress can mean for the district in 2017, but we can refuse to indulge pessimism and forge ahead, continuing to take charge of our own city as we are this morning, while warning Congress not to toy with local democracy. The last word on this matter was the 85% vote by DC residents for the statehood uh, in the statehood referendum in a mandate for full and unequivocal democracy for the people of the District of Columbia. The challenge of the new year presents an opportunity to show we are embarking on that very mandate. Thank you and congratulations to the District of Columbia. Congressmember Norton, thank you very much. Could uh, we ask the former members of the D.C. Council to stand? I see uh, Councilman Lightfoot, Councilmember Alexander, Frank Smith. No David Catania? Okay. 
Right, uh, I, I'm just kidding, I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> right now we'd like to ask uh, Mayor Muriel Bowser to come up. Thank you. Thank you. Well, good morning, Washington, D.C. It is a wonderful day in the District of Columbia. It is the day where we celebrate the elections and where we congratulate and welcome our new members. Let's hear it for the new members of the Council of the District of Columbia. I want to congratulate and thank all of the members who have served, you heard them recognize, and I want to recognize them as well. Give them a big round of applause. So over the past two years, the council and I have worked together to ensure that Washington, D.C. continues to be the best city in the world. Together, we have passed legislation that will raise the minimum wage in Washington, D.C. We have made our streets safer and stronger by creating private security camera programs and closing the loopholes for our GPS program. We have invested over $100 million annually in the Housing Production Trust Fund, $100 million annually in the Housing Production Trust Fund, and we have made unprecedented investments in homeless services and created a real plan to close GC General. We have expanded opportunities for people and students in every ward of the District of Columbia, making unprecedented investments in our schools, developing more robust programs for our summer youth employment program that we permanently named for our mayor for life, Marion Barry. And just this past month, we finished the deployment of our body-worn cameras so that every patrol officer in MPD has a body-worn camera. And just this past November, with your support, we cast the most pronounced statement for statehood for Washington, D.C., with over 80% of the people voting for statehood for the District of Columbia. And of course, as we look forward to working together with this council, I want to say that I have so appreciated getting to know all of the council members coming in. I have worked with most all of them, and I know their passion for the city. And the oath that they are about to take is indeed a sacred one. Sometimes we forget in our celebration to pause and think what the occasion really is. And so I join with Congresswoman Norton who does a fantastic job for us on the Hill and we want to make sure she has a vote in this Congress. I want to thank the chief judge who is here, who represents the other um, part of our government and making sure that the administration of justice in DC is swift and fair. Thank you, chief judge, for your leadership. And also to Chairman Mendelson and all the members of the council, your partnership is indeed important. Your partnership is um, indeed appreciated and needed for us to work together, unify, to speak for the residents of the District of Columbia. Please thank the residents and the members of the council. So to Council Member Grasso and White, to Council Member Evans and Todd, to Council Member Gray and Council Member White, this swearing in. Uh, and I, and people will know, uh, I love administering the oath of office. I myself have taken it twice as an ANC commissioner, three times as a council member, and as mayor. I have delivered it to members of uh, the, our boards and commissions, ANC uh, officials, as well as members of the Board of Education. The part that I always pause on when we make this oath and when we take this oath, we are called and we swear, we affirm that we will make decisions without fear or favor. We swear or affirm 
that our decisions will be made in the best interest of the District of Columbia as a whole. We swear or affirm that we are not making decisions just for our own ward, just for our own interest, just for our own supporters, just for the people that voted for us. We are making decisions for the interest of the District of Columbia as a whole. And that is a solemn oath. Congratulations. Madam Mayor, thank you very much. Uh, right now, we'd like to bring up uh, the city's first elected Attorney General, Carl Racine. Good morning to all of you. Council Member Norton, Mayor Bowser, uh, Chairman Mendelson, the Chief Judges, the other judges, the former Council Members, the current Council Members, and of course, you, the very engaged residents of the District of Columbia. As the Chief Legal Officer of the District of Columbia, I'm honored to be here with you to share on this occasion, which represents the best of our American democratic values and traditions. Seeing all of the dedicated and accomplished public servants gathered here today gives me confidence that we'll continue our progress and shape a stronger, more independent, and more equitable future for the District of Columbia. Our democracy, our government, continues to demonstrate that we're developing into a robust, mature democracy as the establishment of the Independent Office of Attorney General just two years ago demonstrates. In our first two years of independence, the Office of Attorney General has been pleased to develop an exceptional working relationship with the Council. We look forward to continuing to strengthen that relationship and build on successes in passing legislation to enhance public safety, reform juvenile justice, assist seniors, immigrants, and also to preserve affordable housing. Congratulations to all the council members being sworn in today. Whether this will be your first term on the council or your eighth term, Mr. Evans. I must say that I'm particularly proud and pleased to welcome uh, two former Office of Attorney General employees and colleagues uh, to the Council. Uh, that would be Robert C. White uh, and, and Mr. Trayon White. <laughs> uh, I know, uh, having worked shoulder to shoulder with those two young men, that everything that Mayor Bowser spoke of so well, the commitment and the oath of office and what it means to really get down and serve the residents of the District of Columbia, I know that those two young men are going to bring that integrity and that power of commitment to bear. Mm -hmm. Also, of course, congratulate uh, Councilman Grasso, Councilmember Todd, uh, and, uh, of course, also uh, one of my mentors, uh, Chairman Gray, uh, Council Member Gray, uh, back uh, to office. Mm -mm -mm. We look forward uh, to working uh, with this new council uh, for a strong day in District of Columbia. Thank you. Mm -mm -mm. We may um, set a record up here. We're ahead of schedule. Want to keep it that way? <laughs> so uh, right about now, we're going to begin the uh, oath of office of the uh, new council members to be sworn in. Um, each council member is going to have no more than 10 guests uh, to join us on stage. Uh, they've been given their marks, their times. We're not going to keep stopwatch. We're going to trust them. If they're not sworn in by noon, we've got to have another election. We've got to start all over again. <laughs> We'd like to start with the Honorable David Grasso, Council Member at Large. The oath will be administered by the Honorable Richard Sippel. He's an Administrative Law Judge, Federal Communications Commission. Council Member Grasso.
Is that the gun? Where's Maria? Is that the gun? Yeah. Please raise your right hand. I, David Grasso. I, David Grasso. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute the laws of the United States of America. That I will faithfully execute the laws of the United States of America. And of the District of Columbia. And of the District of Columbia. And will, to the best of my ability. And will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. And will faithfully discharge the duties of the office a member of the Council of the District of Columbia. And will faithfully dis discharge of the, uh, the duties of the office of the Council of the District of Columbia. Which I am about to enter. Which I am about to enter. Congratulations. <laughs> Five minutes, you gotta be kidding me. <clears throat> if you didn't know who that was, that was my, uh, my staff, um, who really deserve a lot of the credit for why we're here today. <clears throat> Fellow DC residents, thank you all very much for being here today. I'm extremely humbled by the opportunity to serve the people of the District of Columbia for another four years on the DC Council. I want to thank my father-in-law, Dick Sippel, who swore me in today, um, and the right to freely choose our, representat our representatives, and thus the right to determine our own path and vision for our city, is not taken lightly by me or any of our residents, because it's not too long ago that we remember we didn't have that right. The fact that voter turnout in the 2016 election was the highest in nearly two and a half decades indicates that DC residents are more engaged in our democracy, in our governance, and in our quest for self-determination as the 51st state of the United States of America. <laughs> when, I stood behind you, when I stood before you four years ago, we were in a very different position. Confidence in our local government was low, and I vowed to help bring a new day to the District of Columbia, to engage our residents in our democracy, and to be transparent and ethical when exercising the duty of my office. Today, the council, and indeed our city, is in a better place than ever, and I will continue to fight for real change in DC. I'm particularly proud of what we've done together. We ensured that our children's schools are funded according to need, not politics. We lifted our workers' wages and guaranteed they will not have to choose between taking care of their loved ones and paying their bills. We have promoted the thriving arts and humanities communities and supported a creative economy that a world-class city such as ours deserves. We have just begun reforming our criminal justice system in ways that center on treatment and prevention rather than solely on punishment. And we've continued the upward trajectory of education reform. And in fact, the thing I'm most proud of accomplishing in the past four years is the passage of a ban on suspending or expelling three and four-year-olds in our schools. We have effectively, we have effectively in the District of Columbia eliminated the preschool to prison pipeline. As chair of the Education Committee, I want to thank, especially thank and acknowledge the mayor, Mayor Muriel Bowser, for her selection of a new chancellor. It's going to help us lead the District of Columbia schools to a new place. Thank you, Mayor Bowser. I'm ready and willing to work together as we have done for the past two years since I've been the chair of the committee, to continue to address ways in which we can close the achievement gap, ensure appropriate wraparound services, and put every student in the best position to succeed. It is important to recognize that we entered this next council period under very different circumstances than the last time that I stood before you. The result of the national election reverberated in our city perhaps more than anywhere else in the nation. Many are scared and anxious as our future and the future of our laws are constantly at the whim of a Congress where we have no voting representation from our city and many of its members have never set foot in our diverse neighborhoods. How we educate our children, 
address the needs of our workers, promote the health of our residents, maintain the integrity of our families, and even secure our right to a democratic form of government are at this moment very uncertain. In the days after the 2016 election, I was reminded of the spirit and tenacity of our residents. In protest, our students walked out of their classrooms in droves. In solidarity, they marched downtown. With one voice, they declared that we will not be hostage to the hate and divisiveness of the incoming administration. As the only true representatives of DC residents, we too must take up that call. As elected leaders, we must be willing to stand up and speak with one voice against every provocation and threat to our self-governance and the vision that we have for our great city. We must insist that educating, the education of our children will be accountable to the people of the District of Columbia, not directed by those who disdain the value of public education. We must declare that the war on drugs was a grave injustice and continue our march towards a criminal justice reform and rolling back policies that exasperate racial inequalities. We must protect and respect the rights of women and girls in our LGBTQ community. We must embrace that we are a sanctuary city and that we will protect families and communities from being torn apart by immigration policies rooted in fear and bigotry. And we must declare that we will not tolerate aggressions guised in patriotism and security against our Muslim brothers and sisters. And we must, we must declare that we are the 51st state and demand full participation in our democratic institutions. On these issues, on all of these issues, there can be no compromise. We are to protect and expand on the progress we've made in the District of Columbia. Everything needed to achieve a shared vision of an even brighter future for our city, improving our schools, reforming our criminal justice system, providing more affordable housing, expanding economic opportunities, empowering individual voters over all the special interests, promoting the arts and humanities, all of this is rooted in a basic respect for human rights. Now is, in fact, the time to deepen our efforts to protect the human rights of all of our residents. In that task, I'm extremely grateful to be surrounded in my office by an amazing and talented team who worked tirelessly to make the vision a reality. Their dedication to public service and all of the staff in the council building is admirable, and I would not have accomplished nearly as much as I did without them, and I can't hope to even come close to achieving the agenda we've set for the next four years without such a great staff. But most of all, I want to thank the people of the District of Columbia. I want to thank all of you. Thank you for your place and your trust in me, for the opportunity to serve as an at-large council member for another four years. Protecting our human rights cannot be done alone. It must be the charge of all of our elected leaders and all of our residents. We must fight for each other. We must work for the most vulnerable among us. We must lift each other up, and we must love one another. Thank you very much. Councilmember Grasso, thank you very much. If the family and friends of um, Mr. White could start coming to the stage, we could. Good point, Robert White. Mistake number one, very good. Just, just checking, make sure you're awake out there. Um, coming up next will be a um, young man who's been elected uh, to the council of for an at-large seat, the oath will be administered by the Honorable Eleanor Holmes Norton. We're talking about Robert White, Jr. White, it is an honor to swear you in, who serves so ably as my own legal, legal counsel and now goes on to serve the people of the District of Columbia. Please raise your, your right hand. I, I, Robert White, do solemnly swear or affirm, do swollen, solemnly swear or affirm, 
that I will faithfully execute that I will faithfully execute the laws of the United States of America the laws of the United States of America and of the District of Columbia and of the District of Columbia and will to the best of my ability and will to the best of my ability preserve protect and defend preserve protect and defend the Constitution of the United States the Constitution of the United States and will faithfully discharge the duties of the office and will faithfully discharge the duties of the office of member of the Council of the District of Columbia of member of the Council of the District of Columbia which I am about to enter right now which I am about to enter Congratulations, Robert and family. My fellow Washingtonians, thank you for the opportunity to serve. I owe a lot of thanks because so many of you helped me get here, but I want to give a special thanks to my family, especially my father, who being with the pride only a parent could have, as he invited everyone, including his Uber driver this weekend, to his son's swearing in. <laughs> and to my wife, my foundation, and the best thing about me, Christy. What most people don't know about Christy is that she does not like the spotlight and was never into politics. But she's gone down this road with me out of love and the faith in the work that I plan to do. And while it's very easy to see how beautiful she is, what is less apparent is how selfless she is. That she is smarter than you would ever suspect from her charming approachability, and her will is unbreakable. Although in fairness, I warn not to be fooled by her grace. She is mama bear through and through, and she is not a politician. <laughs> so if you're watching the news one day and the ticker at the bottom says, DC council member's wife gets a little rowdy with local reporter, you know who it was, <laughs> Kobe King. And while my daughter Madison, or Mad as I call her, doesn't yet know how much she's added to my life, this little girl gives new meaning to the work that I'm here to do. You see, Mad will get older and grow conscious of the world around her. She will see either a city that reflects diversity, compassion, and inclusion, or she will see an exclusive city that cares more of its posh and monuments than its people. And she will ask, Dad, what did you do? She will feel either the fabric of a community that embraced the challenge of inclusive growth or a city of a million individuals with no connective thread. And she will ask, Dad, what did you do? And I will have to answer. The story I want to tell my daughter starts in 1982 when two Wilson High School sweethearts, Tamara White and Robert Sr., gave birth to a baby they were so positive would be a girl that they didn't bother picking a boy's name. I'll tell Mad that her grandmother, my mom, relentlessly instilled in me generosity and compassion toward others as if she knew she wouldn't be around long. She succumbed to breast cancer when I was eight. The following month, I nearly died in a car accident on New Hampshire Avenue that left me with a broken skull and severe head trauma. When I was medevac to the hospital, they told my dad in the ICU that if I lived, it was nearly impossible that I would lead a normal life. But God. The years ahead were turbulent, nearly failing out of school until 10th grade when my guidance counselor insisted that it was impossible that I would go to college. It hurt me and made me so angry that I forged my dad's signature on school transfer applications. 
went to college, studied overseas, and went to law school. After law school, I took a chance on a non-traditional legal career to work for Congresswoman Norton in work that I found deeply fulfilling. But there I was, a young attorney making my way in D.C. while my family and so many like them fell further and further behind. So with no reasonable belief that I could win but full of conviction and fight, I quit my job to run for the D.C. Council. I lost. I got back up and with the support of my wife ran in a race that so many said was impossible. And now the real work begins, to be a bridge. I hope to be a bridge between parts of our city that feel so far apart, and a bridge between a strong economy and the opportunity to participate. Despite how different parts of our city sometimes feel, they really are not so different. We all want schools stronger than any social and economic barriers, neighborhoods with restaurants and parks that add to the fabric of our community, and a government that is receptive to everyday people. When we cut through the noise, we hear that the appall of gentrification here does not reflect a hatred of change, but the natural sting of feeling replaced and ignored. The cry for cleaner neighborhoods and better environment is not the mantra of new millennials, but an old familiar song often muted by disappointment. Most of us very much want the same things, even if we believe in different paths and we have to cling to that commonality. The years ahead will be hard, and we will be tested. But our resilience will be measured by our ability and resolve to unite around the common good. That means we have to be willing to put ourselves in other people's shoes, whether it's a business owner who sacrificed everything and is on the cusp of growth, or a young mother making $25,000 a year busing her child across town to the best school she could manage. But as we excel in DC, too many of us can barely hang on. Our median income is $75,000, but 110,000 of our fellow residents live in poverty, including 30,000 children. These are kids just like mine who deserve the opportunity to excel. And I'm here to give it to them. Every morning, I drop Matt off at daycare I drive into work down 5th Street and past the house where we lived when I found out that my mom passed and where I recovered after the car accident. I look at that house every morning fully aware of what simple opportunity can mean. So when my little girl asks me, Dad, what did you do? Whether I fail or succeed, I will say, Mad, your dad tried. And I'll remind her that the impossible really isn't so impossible if you're willing to fight for it. I hope to make her proud. My fellow Washingtonians, I hope to make you proud. Thank you for the opportunity to serve. Okay, here's my new definition of old. If you can remember the DC Council before Jack Evans was on it. <laughs> Replace John Wilson. Right now we'd like to ask the uh, family and friends of um, Councilman Evans to come up. Um, the War II uh, representative um, is gonna take the oath. Uh, it's gonna be administered by the Honorable Robert E. Morin, Chief Judge, Superior Court. I state your name. I, Jack Evans, do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear that I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute the laws of the United States of America. The laws of the United States of America and of the District of Columbia and of the District of Columbia and will to the best of my ability and will to the best of my ability preserve, protect, and defend preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States the Constitution of the United States and will faithfully discharge and will faithfully discharge the duties of the office the duties of the office 
of member of the Council of the District of Columbia, of member of the Council of the District of Columbia, which I am about to enter. Which I am about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Congratulations. Good morning, everyone. They were two months old at my one of my swearings in, and they are now 20 years old. <laughs> That's Catherine, John, and Christine, who are all sophomores in college. Christine is at Parsons School of Design in New York City. Catherine is Elon in North Carolina, and John is at University of Pennsylvania in Philadelphia. So give them a round of applause. <laughs> And at the conclusion of my speech, they'll be leaving because they're heading back to college today. At least Catherine is. So uh, we wish them uh, Godspeed. So I want to take this opportunity to thank all of you and thank the residents of Ward 2 for electing me to another term on the Council of the District of Columbia. In particular, I want to thank those involved in my campaign, my campaign manager, Michael Ramirez. And I want to thank my staff who are with me here today. My chief of staff, Jeanette Grant. We have Ruth, Sherry, and I don't know who else is all with us. Wendy, Serena, anybody I've forgotten? I think that's everybody. Give them a round of applause. They have done a great job in representing not only the residents of Ward 2, but everyone in the city. Um, it's interesting, this is now my eighth term on the Council of the District of Columbia. I am the only member of the council who was actually elected last century. <laughs> but there's no truth to the fact that I was here when Pierre L'Enfant got here. No truth. Uh, but what an experience it's been. And I thought in the time I had, I could talk a little bit about the past, the current, present, and the future. The past. I came to the council in 1991 in a city, Washington, D.C., that was struggling and struggling mightily and only struggled worse from 1991 to 1995. It was a city that was losing population, a city whose finances were in disarray, a city that was having trouble delivering basic services. Kind of sounds like Metro, doesn't it? A little bit. Ooh, boy. More about that in a minute. We worked hard to turn our city around. And I'm proud to say that today, as I stand here, the District of Columbia is the most dynamic city in America. And it really is. We've taken a bond rating from B minus to triple A. Uh, our finances are the envy of cities, county, and states around the country. We have almost $2 billion in our reserve funds. And this quarter, the one we just went through, our CFO told us is the best quarter he has ever seen by any city in America. So we have had a great run financially. Economic development is everywhere, and we will continue to make that happen. But we do still struggle with some of the major urban problems. So although the present looks strong, we have a lot of challenges for the future. Our school system, we have a brand new chancellor. Give him a round of applause. We welcome you to the city. And the goal as we look into the future is to provide a quality education in every neighborhood in the city. That's our goal. And we have to make that happen. That every parent feels that they are sending their child to a neighborhood school that is as good as every neighborhood school in the city. It is our challenge and we can make that happen. Secondly, safety. We have seen a drop in our homicide rate of 17% this year from last year, which is a good drop. But we still have a long way to go to make sure that every neighborhood is as safe as every other neighborhood. That is a challenge going forward into the future. Homelessness. In my 25, 26 years on the council, we have addressed this in a number of ways. And as we stand here today, we still have not fixed that problem. There are still way too many people who are homeless on the streets of Washington, D.C. And we need to get to the root of the problem. So thirdly, as we look to the future, addressing homelessness is a critical issue. 
and affordability that goes along with prosperity. As our city has become prosperous, it has become more difficult for people to live here and to stay here and to move here. I had an adage back in the day as the city was beginning to prosper. For those who have lived here during the hard times, they get to stay here in the good times. And that's something we all have to work together to make happen. So in summary, as we look to the future and have a vision to the future, we have the resources, and I want to stress this, because we have managed the city so well over the time period, we have the resources to provide a quality education to every one of our children. It is just a matter of getting it done. We have the resources to provide a safe neighborhood for every one of our residents. We just have to get it done. We have the resources to provide a home for every person on the street who is homeless today. We just have to get it done. And we have the resources to provide a decent life for every resident of the District of Columbia. We just have to get it done. One of my favorite quotes is from someone when I was growing up that I admired, Robert Kennedy. And at the end of every speech, he said, some men dream things, some men see things as they are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask, why not? That is the challenge as we go forward in this city. We have an opportunity to dream and to make those dreams a reality. That is the challenge we have going forward. Thank you all for your support over the years. God bless and God bless the District of Columbia. Councilman Jack Evans. Up uh, next is the Ward 4 Councilman Brandon Todd. <clears throat> the oath will be administered by the Honorable Robert R. Rigsby, Associate Judge, Superior Court. Council member, are you ready? Yes. <laughs> I, please state your name. I, Brandon T. Todd. Do solemnly swear or affirm. Do solemnly swear or affirm. That I will faithfully execute the laws of the United States of America. That I will faithfully execute the laws of the United States of America. And the District of Columbia. And the District of Columbia. And will. And will. To the best of my ability. To the best of my ability. Preserve. Preserve. Protect. Protect. And defend the Constitution of the United States. And defend the Constitution of the United States. And will faithfully discharge. And will faithfully discharge. The duties of the office of member of the council. The duties of the office of member of the council. Of the District of Columbia. Of the District of Columbia. Which I am about to enter. Which I am about to enter. Congratulations, Thank Mr. You. Council Member. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right, good morning, War Four in the District of Columbia. Today is the second time that I have taken the oath of office to serve as the council member representing the best 82,000 people that the District of Columbia has to offer, and that is Ward Four. Each time, this moment holds for me a keen awareness of this great responsibility and the challenges that lie ahead. And yet, it also brings forth my undying optimism that the residents of Ward 4 and the District of Columbia can face these challenges together and create a Washington that is the envy of the region, the country, and yes, even the world. My arrival at this point today is by no accident. First, I must thank the, ward, the residents of Ward 4. We began this journey over two years ago. You went door to door with me, engaged in living rooms, churches, and on street corners. You asked me the tough questions and challenged the status quo. You lifted me up and you kept me honest. 
and on April 28, 2015, you sent me down to the council in a special election. And on June 14, 2016, you reaffirmed your faith and trust in me to continue to represent you for a full four-year term. And for that, I am eternally grateful and will be as focused over the next four years as I have been over these last 20 months. I would like to thank my mother and my grandmother and all of my family present today for your steadfast guidance and support that has brought me to this point and for instilling in me a pride in my hometown and a willingness to serve. More thanks goes to my campaign team led by my chairman, Darrell Wiggins, my treasurer, Ben Soto, campaign manager, Jackson Carnes, and communications chair, Everett Hamilton. Now, as a ward council member, you are only as good as your staff. Yes, I'm biased, because I know that I have the best team at the John A. Wilson building. I wanna say thank you to my Ward 4 council staff, because over the last 20 months, you have ensured that we have delivered on an agenda that touches all 20 neighborhoods, from Chevy Chase to Riggs Park to Petworth, where I live. And finally, I must thank the Honorable Robert Rigsby for being here today to swear me in. This Ward 4 resident is a distinguished Army veteran, former DC Attorney General, and an eminent jurist. But more importantly, he's a mentor and a good friend. So thank you for being here this morning, Judge. Ward 4, we have an impressive list of accomplishments to celebrate today. Our public safety efforts have produced the sharpest year-to-date reduction in crime of any ward in the city. Overall, crime is down by 18%, and that is an incredible accomplishment that we should all be proud of. But yet, we know there is still work to be done. Residents in Ward 4 and D.C. deserve to feel safe in their homes and community. During my time on the council, I have vigorously pursued common sense solutions that will enhance public safety, such as pushing for all of Ward 4 to have access to the security camera rebate program, which has provided our police department with an unprecedented ability to identify and deter criminal activity. I will continue to be focused on public safety. Whether you have children or not, we all know the importance of a good education. In Ward 4, there has been tremendous progress made. Together, we, in, we completed the modernizations of Roosevelt Senior High School, Lafayette Elementary, High, Lafayette Elementary School, and the phase modernization at Shepherd Elementary. These investments will provide our students with a world-class facilities, which are essential to a world-class education. But we know we are not finished, and I look forward to working with the members of the council and the mayor to ensure that we continue to invest in War Four schools. Today, we also celebrate more affordable housing. Our model in Ward 4 doesn't push out long-term residents, nor does it stigmatize our new neighbors. In Ward 4, we work together and take care of everyone. We have laid out and implemented a bold agenda on affordable housing, starting with a $100 million commitment to the Affordable Housing Production Trust Fund. In the last two years, we have broken ground on 450 Ward 4 affordable units, which consist of a mix of new and preserved housing. But we know we must do more. Where will we be without seniors? Right, without our seniors. The people who have literally made Washington, D.C. one that over 1,000 people each month move to every year. I represent the best 17,000 seniors in the District of Columbia, and I will continue to push for more innovative solutions to improve seniors' quality of life so that they can age in place and experience the fullness that Washington, D.C. has to give. I'm proud that as a result of a legislation that I authored, we will open a brand new legal clinic that will provide legal services for seniors at the University of the District of Columbia. 
I will continue to be laser focused and move forward with a smart and sustainable economic development agenda. Over the last decade, we've seen hundreds of, thou hundreds of thousands of people move to Washington. New jobs, new residents, and new opportunity are flowing in our city each and every year. When I took office in May of 2015, workforce unemployment rate stood at 6.3%. In the past 20 months, working with the Bowser administration, being focused on job creation, workforce unemployment rate is at 5.7% and we will work to continue to accelerate the progress that is made along Georgia Avenue, Kennedy Street, and Riggs Road. We will continue to guide the redevelopment of Walter Reed, which will be a redeveloped 66 acres, including housing, retail, and much more. More importantly, I am committed to bringing residents and the business community together in the spirit of our shared mission to ensure that we develop smart and pragmatic policies that work for DC residents and DC residents only. Trust me, I love my regional neighbors in Maryland and Virginia, but I'm here to tell you that my focus over the next four years will be to ensure that our economic development progress is reserved for the residents of the soon to be 51st state. I believe in DC first. My DC First agenda starts with my new role as the chairman of the Council's Committee on Government Operations. I look forward to ushering in a new era of government accountability and efficiency that puts DC First in innovation and service that reduces waste, ensuring that our government's agencies remain accountable to the residents and the taxpayers of the District of Columbia. So today, I pledge to you that I will continue fighting for seniors and their ability to age in place, for accelerated school reforms, for sensible economic development, for government accountability that is second to none, and affordable housing and good paying DC jobs. I know that together there is nothing that we cannot achieve. You can be certain that I will make deliberate, informed, and honest decisions on your behalf, and that my integrity rests on my word to be your voice and your champion at City Hall. So let's roll up our sleeves and get to work on moving forward Ward 4 in the District of Columbia. Thank you, God bless Ward 4, and God bless the City of Washington, D.C. This is going great. We're doing fine on the time. This will take 10 seconds. C could I ask all of the council staff members to stand up for a second? Come on. All of the council staff members, give yourselves a round of applause. We appreciate what you do also. Just wanted to put a face with a name so when I call down there, I know who I'm talking about. <laughs> I'm just kidding. Right, <laughs> I wasn't kidding. Uh, right now, we'd like to bring up the Honorable Vincent Gray. He's a council member from Ward 7. The oath will be administered by the Honorable Lee Satterfield, retired Chief Judge, Superior Court. Vincent C. Gray. Do solemnly swear. Do solemnly swear. That I will faithfully execute. That I will faithfully execute. The laws of the United States of America. The laws of the United States of America. And of the District of Columbia. And of the District of Columbia. And will, to the best of my ability. And will, to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend. Preserve, protect, and defend. The Constitution of the United States. The Constitution of the United States. And will faithfully discharge. And will faithfully discharge. The duties of the office. The duties of the office. Of member of the Council of the District of Columbia. Of member of the Council of the District of Columbia. Which I'm about to enter. Which I'm about to enter. Welcome back, my friend. <laughs>
Thank you very much and good morning, everyone. Good morning. Twelve years ago today, uh, not 26, <laughs> uh, I was just kidding, my good friend Jack Evans saying, wow, 26 years is a long time. It's unprecedented and probably will stand as a record forever, Jack. So thank you for all your service. It was 12 years ago today uh, that I took, first took the oath of office as a council member. For the next decade thereafter, I had the honor of serving my fellow residents of the District of Columbia. Today, I return to work on vital issues and tackle challenges that will uplift and empower the citizens of Ward 7. We will touch people across the District of Columbia as well. In every corner of our city, there are people with great needs, voices that must be heard, and challenges that we must rise to meet. During my two years away from official government, and especially over these past months on the campaign trail, I heard from many people. I listened not as a mayor or a council member, but as a neighbor, as a friend, and a citizen who wanted to help. I come to work today with an even greater focus and an even clearer understanding of my mission. There is real urgency to the work that we're called to do, and we must never lose sight of how important our success is for those we seek to help. We cannot shy away from difficult tasks or succumb to the illusion of easy solutions. We cannot gloss over our greatest challenges with mere rhetoric or hollow slogans. My determination is steeled. My working together and encouraging thoughtful, open debate, we can achieve many things. We will build on our many accomplishments and break new ground as well. As we come together today to see our elected officials sworn into office, I am reminded of another swearing in ceremony. At his first inauguration, President Barack Obama reminded us that we are exceptional because of our allegiance to an idea articulated in the Declaration of Independence. I quote, we hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. And then President Obama went on to say, and I quote, today, we continue a never-ending journey to bridge the meaning of these words with the realities of our time. As history tells us, that, will, that while these truths may be self-evident, they've never been self-executing. I know that everyone in this room will miss the inspiration and leadership of President Obama. And we must honor his service by heeding his words. Indeed, there is much work to be done, and if we don't do it, who will? Look no further than yourself. Lead by example. Bring people together with an open mind and an open heart. Our challenges are real, but together our ability to overcome them is absolutely limitless. A few weeks ago on December 3rd, I hosted a Ward 7 resident summit. I invited the people of Ward 7 to attend and to share what was on their minds about their city and their ward, to share their most serious concerns and their biggest hopes. I thought maybe 150 people would show up, but in the end, more than 400 residents came out. They came prepared and dedicated, and dedicated many hours of their time. Many concerns were voiced, but we heard even more positive ideas for improving our city. Public safety, economic development, education, affordable housing, health care, 
and dignity and security for our senior citizens were paramount. As a, as a council member, you can count on me to be thoughtful, inclusive, and forward-looking. You can count on me to perform dog, dogged oversight to ensure that the government you pay for, that you pay for every day, and those who work on behalf of our government are doing their very best to improve the condition of our city. You can count on me to put you and the interests of our city above politics. And you can count on me to listen. My constituents will know that their concerns are respected and that a phone call or an email will result in problem-solving action. There will be no passing of the buck because that is what we were elected. We were elected not to do, to be able to provide action in response to people's problems. We've already hit the ground running. I look forward to engaging with council colleagues and moving our city forward. There is no shortage of good ideas, but actions speak louder than words. Too many people in our city have watched while some neighborhoods benefit from prosperity and others remain stagnant. Mired in problems we must confront head on and without delay. For instance, I look forward to once and for all building together a real and enduring health care system on the east end of our city in our great city. And I look forward also to spearheading universal access for all infants and toddlers as part of a model early childhood education system. Our city is vibrant and growing, but too many residents are still living without jobs. They live without the security of a stable home or the certainty of a warm meal. Not enough of the district's economic development is reaching people with the greatest need. So, my friends, it is time to double down on our efforts and refuse to accept anything less than success. And so, from the neighborhoods of Hillcrest to Deanwood, which is now on the map, to Penn Branch, to Watts Branch, Northeast Boundary, Randall Highlands, Kenilworth, Eastland Gardens, Parkside, to River Terrace, and of course to Marshall Heights. Let's move together, let's work together, so we can thrive together, succeed together, and in the last analysis, to be able to prosper together. So once and for all, ladies and gentlemen, I ask you to join me in our mutual quest to succeed. Let's get to work. Thank you very much. The Honorable um, Trey Ann White, Jr. is up next. <laughs> Council member from Ward 8. Oath will be administered by the Honorable Carl A. Racine, Attorney General. Mr. Uh, Treyon White, would you place your hand on the Bible? Thank you. I, uh, Treyon White, do solemnly swear or affirm, do so solemnly swear or affirm, 
that I will faithfully execute the laws of the United States of America. That I will faithfully execute the laws of the United States of America. And of the District of Columbia. And of the District of Columbia. And will to the best of my ability. And will to the best of my ability. Preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States. Pre preserve, protect, and defend the Constitution of the United States of America. And will faithfully discharge the duties. And will faithfully discharge the duties. Of Council of. Of Council of the District of Columbia. Which ward? Ward 8. <laughs> For which I'm about to enter. For which I'm about to enter. Congratulations. Thank you, Paul. Start my time, yeah. I'm using my iPad. So that means do not call me, you're gonna mess up my speech. <laughs> so, first, I would like to thank uh, God for getting me here to this moment. Without him, nothing is possible. So I also want to thank uh, my ancestors who paid the way for me to get here. And I'll start by naming a few. William Lockridge, Janice Pickett, Patricia Roberts, James Bunn, Grandma E. Carter, A.J. Cooper, Timothy Dawkins, Christopher Burry, Brandon Braswell, My Rock, Jean Ann Roberts, and the legendary Marion S. Burry. It is with great shoulders that I stand today. I thank God because he takes pleasure and takes the foolish things of the world to shame the wise. He takes those things that aren't to nullify the things that are. He takes pleasure in taking the dirtiest things, clean them up and make them shine so bright. For not for our sake, but for his glory. And I'm one of those seeds. Ain't God good, y'all? I think this morning I turned into a preacher when I woke up this morning. <laughs> I was listening to my gospel music this morning. I said, oh, I'm about to preach myself today. <laughs> I'm reminded of a saying my grandmother, Jean Ann Roberts, used to say. She used to say, trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not into your own understanding. And in all your ways acknowledge him. He shall direct your path. <laughs> and I'm excited this morning about the opportunity to lead. See, I grew up in, in Southeast D.C. during the 80s and 90s. Was it, it, where it wasn't as prosperous as it is today. And so many struggles to get through those times. See, I submit to, submit to you today that all is not lost. We stand here, I want to, everyone who worked on the We the People's campaign to stand up briefly, stand up. You worked on the We the People's campaign, stand up. I want to thank you all for helping me, for supporting me, for praying for me, for encouraging me, to help us to the five hours, you may take your seats. Thank you. We show people what it is like when people come together for a common cause. We show people what we can do. We come together on one accord, one, accord, one heart, one mind, and one vision. And in November, we defy the odds. See, as I travel throughout the city, I have a, a wallet. My mother always told me, try and get your wallet, because she keep my stuff in a Ziploc bag. Uh, and she told me, get a wallet. And in my wallet, I keep my food stamp card, my former food stamp card, because it reminds me of my humble beginnings, of where I came from, and where God has taken me. I always learn you should never forget where you come from, because you might have to go back. It reminds me that as D.C. grows to a prosperous city, the poor is getting poor and the rich is getting richer. It reminds me that as cranes go up in the sky, we are concerned about economic development, but little concerned about people development. 
It reminds me that it costs $300 per day on average to incarcerate one of our youth. Yet it costs about $78 every day to do an after school program. So it's my desire as the new leadership in Washington, D.C. to change the paradigm of how we lead in Washington, D.C. See, the day of sleeping is over. In the spirit of Sankofa, serving is not something that we should do. Serving is something that we must do. While we are excited that I'm in office, we should be equally as excited about the chance to organize ourselves and our spheres of influence to demand what we want and what we need. It is your job not to just, not to just be happy that I got elected, but to hold me accountable, to hold our elected officials accountable, because we're in a day and time where no one, I, mean, I, I repeat, no one gets a pass. See, I was in Atlanta, Maryland uh, a few months ago, probably a couple of months ago now, where I ran into a lady, and she said, how you doing, Mr. White? She called me Trayvon White. I know my mother doesn't like that. It's actually Trayvon, and I'm a senior, not a junior. Let's get that together. She said, uh, I voted for you. I was like, you voted for me? You live in Atlanta, Maryland. She said, see, I, I live in a, a homeless shelter out here in a hotel in Atlanta, Maryland. We're DC residents here. And I, quite, I can't quite, quite remember if it was actually Atlanta, but it was an L. Lago, Atlanta, one of the Maryland's. And she began to tell me how she was having trouble getting her children to school in the morning waiting for this bus. I was, she was like, all the kids go to D.C. public schools. And so in my heart began to get sad. And I began to realize that we have a mighty work ahead of us. And I submit to you today that I can't do this alone. See, let me tell you, over the last 10 years, I know for a fact that Baloo Recreation Center was closed. Hawk Rock Recreation Center was closed, and the Costia Recreation Center was closed, or Recreation Center was closed, uh, Malcolm X Recreation Center was closed, was reopened, and number 11 Boys and Girls Club, where I came up, was closed down. <laughs> See, we need a redirection uh, of, of, of resources to our community, not a, not a divestment, but an investment back to where our community lies. I look forward to working with Mayor Bowser, Chairman Mendelson and the rest of my colleagues to ensure we will fight for everyday residents of the District of Columbia. In fact, we've already started. My men in the middle still stand up while leading the guys. We started going into the middle schools to recruit guys off the streets, off the corners. You can take your seat. To get involved, to changing the paradigms of our young people in the city. Because the time of talking is over. We live in a time where I served on the school where we often gave accolades about how we're improving our education system, and we are. But the sad reality is that for African American boys throughout the city, the gap of achievement is steadily widening and widening, widening. And as I get all the calls from my brothers over the DC jail and all across the United States saying, Trey, I need $20, it reminds me we have to think differently about how we educate, empower, and pour into our most vulnerable residents. Together, we will work day and night to ensure we put people back to work. There is no excuse with, with why anyone who wants and is able to get a job in D.C. cannot participate in the American dream. Today, during these times, we will make a constant decision to not accept being mediocre. We will encourage people to start their own businesses. Like when I met with Deputy Mayor Courtney Stoughton, they encouraged people to join uh, Project 500 to stand up businesses. D.C. gives out millions and millions of dollars, but every time I hear minority business, they feel like they're getting the short end of the stick, and today, to, it, it is over. So as I, as I go in closing, I would like to encourage you, because if we look back two years from now, and I'm a council member, the community hasn't gotten any better, know that, I, know that I'm, not, I'm not just at fault, but we all act fault because we all have a role and responsibility to play regardless of title. So the words of hearing for, don't just find fault, find a remedy. And it goes with our campaign slogan, don't just stand there, do something. I love y'all, God bless.
Right on time. Right now, we'd like to ask the uh, chairman of the council, Phil Mendelson, to come forward. Thank you, Bruce. Good morning. Uh, before I go any further, I want to again acknowledge former council members who are here. A couple have come in uh, since the, uh, a few were introduced. Council member Alexander, former council member from Ward 7. <laughs> council member Bill Lightfoot, former at-large member. Council member Frank Smith uh, from Ward 1. Uh, Jim Nathanson, former council member from Ward 3. My former boss. Council member Vincent Orange at large. Are there any other former council members who are here? Uh, thank you all for being here. Um, Congresswoman Norton, Mayor Bowser, uh, Attorney General Carl Racine, colleagues and members of the public. This is our new council. I think this will be one of the best councils ever with members who are dedicated to the issues challenging our city and our government. Our city is very healthy. Our population continues to grow as people flock to the city at close to 1,000 new residents each month. Government revenues continue to grow as more jobs are created, more residents find jobs, and unemployment drops. Revenues for the fiscal year just ended are about $221 million above the estimates from September, and revenues for fiscal year 2018 are now estimated at $533 million. That's over $1.5 billion more than the revenues we received in fiscal year 2015. Our city is very healthy. We have no unfunded pension liability, unlike many cities and states. We have cash reserves approaching the recommended standard of two months operating costs. For the first time in decades, if not since home rule, we avoided short-term borrowing to meet cash flow needs. Yet, we have significant challenges. Every council member on this dais and the mayor are committed to affordability for our residents. And yet, housing affordability remains a challenge, witness to continued growth in homelessness. And every council member on this dais and the mayor are committed to improving public education in the District of Columbia. And yet test scores for both the traditional and charter schools, while improving, remain unsatisfactory, and the achievement gap between blacks and whites is unacceptable. I'm optimistic about the new Council Period 22 and our ability to address these cha challenges. We will continue to have separate committees focused on education, chaired by Councilmember David Grasso, and housing, chaired by Councilmember Anita Bonds. And we are returning to having separate committees focused on human services, such as TANF and homelessness, chaired by Councilmember Brianne Nadeau, and health, chaired by Councilmember Vince Gray. Our city has made amazing strides, beginning under former Mayor Anthony Williams, in reducing the uninsured and increasing access to quality health care. And yet, as you know, we wonder today whether the incoming United States President will roll back the Federal Affordable Care Act and will put new stress on our local health care system. For the first time, we will have separate committees in Council Period 22 to focus on labor and workforce development, chaired by Councilmember Alyssa Silverman, and on business development, chaired by Councilmember Kenyon McDuffie. My hope is that putting these sometimes conflicting issues, that is, helping workers while stimulating business profitability, Putting these into separate committees will enable us to develop better public policy and a better local economy. Council members Jack Evans and Mary Che will return as chairman of the committees on finance and revenue and transportation and the environment, where I think everyone agrees they have served well. Council member Brandon Todd will become chairman of the resurrected Committee on Government Operations, where he can give better focus to the internal operations of government, such as the Office of the City Administrator and OCTO, our Office of Information Technology, better attention than perhaps we've given over the past two years. Finally, Councilmember Charles Allen will take leadership over the Committee on Judiciary and Public Safety. This was my committee for eight years. I know the importance of issues such as access to justice and police community relations, and I'm very optimistic that Councilmember Allen has the skills to address the important issues in this area, and I thank him for this. 
A strong legislature is vital to good government. Too often people look at the occasional tension between the legislative and executive branches and they worry. It is correct, in my view, to worry about a legislature that controls the government. But our form of local government is modeled after the federal system, and the Founding Fathers were deliberate in their creation of a government with checks and balances. The legislature is the policy branch of the government. The legislature is the people's branch of the government. With the change in, our, in three of our members resulting from last year's election, the council has been retuned to better reflect our citizens' priorities and concerns. But a lesson I learned early in my service as a council member is that while the public wants a strong legislature, it also wants a government that works. While tension between the mayor and the council are great fodder for headlines and gossip, citizens don't like it. If I may venture into punditry, I think the recent national election was a reaction and a rejection of gridlock in Washington. People may hold strongly to their views for and against issues. But what they really want is for their elected officials to work things out, to look for solutions that may involve compromise. So this, too, is our challenge as a council, to take our newfound energy with three new council members and five new committees and work with our mayor to find solutions, solutions to the pressing issues of affordable housing, quality education, economic and workforce development, effective social services, public health, and public safety. This new council is up to the task, and we ask you to hold us accountable. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. You're looking good. Mr. Guasso, Mr. White, Mr. Evans, Mr. Todd, Mr. Gray, Mr. White, congratulations. Right now, we'd like to call the Reverend Monsignor W. Ronald Jameson. He's pastor of St. Matthew Cathedral for the benediction. Let us pray. Good and gracious God, the all-powerful source of life and goodness, wisdom and holiness, justice and mercy, you call us to make our way through this life with you and challenge us to walk arm and arm with each other. As we confront the human condition of society, you bless us with our minds and hearts to work together for the common good and justice for all. We are all bonded together by our desire to build a better city, better communities, and better neighborhoods. We thank you today, Almighty God, for giving our council members the opportunity to serve the people of our great city. Help them to act with character and conviction. Help them to listen with understanding and goodwill. Help them to speak with charity and restraint. Give them a spirit of service Guide them to lead your people with wisdom and courage. Help them to see the dignity of those who disagree with them and to treat all persons, no matter how weak or poor, with the reverence your creation deserves. In your loving goodness, almighty God, Bless our D.C. City Council members so that in all their deliberations and discussions they will always be inspired by the vision of your loving kindness and saving grace. May they be a light shining in the darkness. May we all work together to make our nation's capital an example 
of how a complex, pluralistic, democratic society can come together and that we can be that light that shines in the darkness, the city on the mountaintop shining brightly. Finally, gracious Lord, we ask that you let the brightness, gentleness, and mercy of your countenance shine upon this great city and all of us who see here our home, the dwelling place of our children who are our future, and the place where our aspirations and dreams can be realized. All of this we ask in your most holy name. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Monsignor. Uh, again, Happy New Year, everybody. That's it for this side of the program. <laughs>